Good evening. Good evening. Today's Wednesday of the uh, Holy Week. As you prepare for the uh, resurrection, resurrection day, praise God. It's wonderful times to um, just celebrate what the Lord has done. He has risen. I know we'll have the message on uh, Sunday, but it's good to prepare and just be ready for what God has for us. Amen. Even tonight, whatever God has, we want to be able to receive it and just be strengthened. Sometimes during the midweek, we're a little bit tired of, um, you know, things going on during the week, and we come to the house of God and we rest. We rest in his presence, and we rest with God's people because the Lord is good. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can come into your house just to receive from you, Lord, just to be together and acknowledge your presence, to acknowledge what you've done for each of us. Lord, bless this time together, our worship, our word, our fellowship. Lord, we pray for those who are still traveling to be here, those who couldn't come. Lord, you be with them, those who are afflicted, who need your touch. Father, lift up my um, uh, cousin's uh, son who needs your touch, Lord, as he's in the hospital. He's only seven years old, Adam. So we put him in your hands, Lord, as even you're doing a miracle in his life. And we thank you for your goodness. Bless this time together as we look to you, even as we prepare to worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord. Yeah. 
Here, no. 
surrender all I have is yours so what can I say what can I do but offer this heart oh God completely
there's no one beside you. Forever the hope in my heart. Let's tell them one more time. To be like you, give all I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one beside you. Forever hope in my Lord, if you didn't do what you did for us, we would have nothing. Lord, our lives would just be short and difficult at times. And yet, Lord, you have brought us hope through your love and through your sacrifice. And you did it lovingly and unselfishly. And we just want to honor you for that tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we greet one another tonight? Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight to honor God, to worship the Lord. Uh, welcome tonight. A few announcements. Um, this is obviously Easter week. Tomorrow night is prayer at 630 here at the church, if you can make it. Friday, we have Good Friday service at 7 p.m., and we're also going to have communion this Friday. So if you can be here, that'd be awesome. Sunday morning. Sunrise service, 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> so if you can be here. Oh, wait, they changed the time, huh, Pastor Mike? So I think it's 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> it's 3.30 somewhere, you know, the sun. But 6.30 a.m., sunrise service. And then also at 9.30, we'll have our regular service. And then if you haven't had a chance to, Pastor Mike's been sharing uh, every night this week about the day that Jesus lives. So on Monday, he shared what the scripture teaches about his disciples and Jesus on Monday, yesterday, and so check those out. I think they're on YouTube and Facebook. So thank you for doing that. Appreciate appreciate your love for us in that. Amen. Is there anything else? No prayer Saturday unless you want to come by yourself and pray. You can't, <laughs> but you have to do it outside the gate because the gate won't be open. <laughs> That's cool. All right, Pastor Mike. Praise God. The Lord is good. Amen. It, it might feel like 3.30 at 6.30, but <laughs> it's a big difference. Praise God. Well, the Lord is good. Um, 
we're going to be uh, postponing the Life of David series uh, for today, and we will move it, we'll continue it next week, I should say. But uh, as we've gone through um, a portion of Holy Week uh, so far, beginning with uh, Palm Sunday, the triumphant entry, we're going to continue uh, going through uh, the last week of Jesus' life here on earth. Um, we also have to remember as we go through this that um, there is so much that went on in his life, especially that last week. Uh, you could go through, um, I'm blanking on the exact number of, of, of chapters uh, in John that it covers, and there's so much that's gone on. So what we're doing is we're touching on those things. Uh, if you've uh, had an opportunity to watch um, uh, the videos, they're, they're shorter. It's just kind of a, a quick touch to keep our, our mind and heart set upon him, just a, just a snack, I guess you will, and then you can always continue on your own in studying those things. But tonight, uh, we're going to look at uh, the parable of the wicked vine dressers. So I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 11. Praise God. So this week we've looked at, as I mentioned before, the triumphant entry as uh, prophecies, so many prophecies were fulfilled in this, uh, the prophecy of Daniel and, and many others. Um, we looked at the the fruitless fig tree on Monday uh, and that was uh, cursed and, and withered as a picture of, of Israel, as the nation of Israel. And uh, we also looked at uh, the cleansing of the temple uh, by Jesus, which brought us to uh, verse 18 of chapter 11 in Mark. We had some unhappy religious leaders of the day. Their, their pocketbooks were being affected. And you know how that can anger people. But when you're crooked and you're stealing and fleecing the flock, I guess they were a little more angry than most. Because it says in verse 18 of chapter 11, Mark chapter 11, verse 18, And the scribes and the chief priests heard it, and they sought how they might destroy him. For they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching. Praise God. It says, and when evening had come, he went out from the city. So we know that God's timing is perfect. Jesus knew exactly what was going to go on and when it was going to happen. And he knew that the cross was coming. So in each situation that we look at, even as uh, the cleansing of the temple, I'm sure really stirred up the, the, the beehive or the wasp's nest of these religious leaders because, as they, as they say, they, just, they desired to destroy him. So and Jesus knew that the cross was coming on Friday. So as we, as we continue in that, we went uh, through... Jesus, uh, his authority being questioned, and that was a portion of last night's uh, study in verse 27. It says, Then they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him. So they, they, they were waiting for him. It says, as he walked in, they, they were ready to pounce. Verse 28. And they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? And we know those things to be, as he came in, uh, it was thought of, as was shared on Sunday, it could have been close to 2 million people that were there, worshiping, screaming, Hosanna, save us now. This had to really uh, bring a, 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 a sense of nervousness and fear in the heart of all the religious leaders because this, uh, this was their field. This was their, uh, home, their home base. They, they were in charge of the things that were going on here. 
And then as he went through and cleansed the temple, even more so did that stir them up. So they came and asked him, well, who said you could do this stuff? Because we, we're the law around here. They're the sheriff in this town. So as Jesus heard these questions, he asked them, he answered in this manner, verse 29. But Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one question, then answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. He called them out to ask them where, as religious leaders, they stood on the baptism of John. And, they, and it says they reasoned among themselves. It says, was it of heaven or of man? See, this would have answered the question that they asked of Jesus by answering this question honestly, but they weren't looking for an honest answer. They were looking for a safe answer, a way to hide it says 31, they reasoned among themselves saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? But if you say from men, they fear the people for they all counted John to be, to have been a prophet indeed. So they answered and said to Jesus, yo no sé. <laughs> we don't know. We do not know. So these profound religious leaders that have so much of the word of God memorized in the Old Testament, how they were truly looked on as knowledgeable men, put their heads together, made a rock pile and said, we don't know. They were scared. They were us scared. And Jesus answered them and said, neither will I tell you what authority I do these things. So he didn't give them an answer in this, but he gives them a parable. And that's what we're going to be going through tonight. So before we begin this, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads so we can pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house this night, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your word, for it is true, Lord. Father, we trust in you in all things, and we ask that you continue to minister to your people in a mighty way. You're a good God who is able, Father. And we ask that you would just, by your Holy Spirit, continue to move in our hearts and strengthen us lord bless those who are afflicted father as was prayed before you know each one by name and all they go through and continue to go before us as a body as we go through even this special holy week bless even this word tonight in jesus name amen amen so he said his answer was i'm not going to answer you if you're not going to answer me so but he did give an answer in the next chapter in the following few verses because it says in, in chapter 12, verse 1, then he began to speak to them in parables. So them, we know, we know who they are by, by, chap, by a verse 27 of the last chapter. It says that they were the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders that came to him. So, so he said, a man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it. He dug a place for the wine vat and built a tower. He leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now at vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruits, some of the fruits of the vineyard from the vine dressers. So, so far, we have an owner. Of the vine of the of, of the vineyard the owner who planted it it says the owner who set a hedge around it uh, to protect it the owner who dug a place for the wine vat for the crop for the produce to be held in uh, he built a tower also so that they could watch over the whole vineyard and keep it safe from thieves he made every arrangement and put everything in place and then leased it to the vine dressers and said, and he went to a far country. Um, remember one thing as we go through this, this isn't, Jesus isn't speaking of, of people. It's a parable. It's a, uh, we've always known it as a, a, a heavenly, uh, a earthly story with a heavenly message, I should say. So as Jesus is sharing these things, he's saying all was provided. And now, 
he went to a faraway place. It said, but in verse 2, that the that at vintage time, when it was when it was time for the crops to come in, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that they might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dresser. Again, not seeming out of line. Doesn't say he sent soldiers or a, or a, 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 a group of of, of, a, of you know of men to take everything that was that was done. He was just receiving what he had done. In verse 3, and they took him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. So this was their response to the owner of the vineyard asking for what was due him. What they had received, they had done nothing to earn it. But they considered it theirs. They said, we're not sharing ours. And, and the proof of that was by beating this servant and sending him away so that he left empty-handed verse 4 and he sent another servant and at him they threw stones wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully treated again it's unusual that jesus is sharing this with the religious leaders and he's giving such specifics He's saying, again, they sent another servant and, he, and they, they threw stones at him. He was stoned and wounded and he was hit in the head. They treated him shamefully. And in verse 5, it says, and again, he sent another to him and they killed. And many others Beating some, killing, and killing some. So, the picture, why is Jesus sharing about such an evil vine dresser? That these people were so self-absorbed in everything they had that they were going to put out and not listen to anything that was coming to them. They weren't going to listen to these uh, servants that were coming as representatives of the owner and all they were doing was asking for what was due they were asking for what was due and it escalated it started off with a beating and it continued up and, and stoning and killing and this owner even continued to send more servants this was really a true picture of mercy and long suffering in the eyes of the owner. Again, this is not something that happened. Jesus is sharing this to make his point. He's showing that this owner showed mercy above and beyond because most people would have been in a condition that you're not going to give me after I did all that. You know what? That's, that's my house. That's my vineyard. That's everything there is, is what I own. And you're going to tell me that I can't have any of the fruits from it. He put everything together for them. But this owner wasn't that way. He, he was merciful. He was giving them opportunity. And he said, we'll send another servant to, to, to reach out to them. Maybe this servant will reach him. The vineyard is really something, and if we keep our finger here, or you can even just look up at the board, in uh, Isaiah chapter 5. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1. It says, now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up, he cleared out its stones, and he planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in the midst, and he also made a wine press for it. So he expected to bring forth good grapes. 
but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. Verse 4. What more could I have done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then would I expect to bring forth? Why then, when I expected to bring forth good fruit, did I bring forth wild grapes? Verse 5. And now, please, let, let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned. I will break down its walls, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste, and it shall not, <clears throat> it shall not be pruned or dug. But there shall come up briars and thorns. And I will also command the clouds that they rain no more on it. Verse 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. See, these are things that the religious leaders would have known. They would have, we can go back to, uh, well, actually, let's, let's turn to, to Matthew chapter 21. We'll look at this same story in a, in a different gospel. In Matthew 21. So these religious leaders were hearing from Jesus, and this had to ring familiar in their ear. Verse, uh, chapter 21 of Matthew, uh, verse 33. It says, Here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower, and he leased it to the vine dressers and went into a far country. Now when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dresser so that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servant, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Verse 36, and again he sent other servants more than the first, and they did likewise to them. They were, in essence, trying to take over the vineyard. They were looking at something that was not theirs, and they were trying to keep it for themselves. They were not producing anything for anyone else but themselves. So it says that in all these things that had happened, the owner still showing compassion, still with a concern that they would understand and give what they were supposed to give. This had to be something that was dealt with prior. I'm sure he didn't just hire, it says they hired these vine dressers, and I'm sure he didn't just say, come on in, take everything, and then do whatever you want with it, and don't have to give me anything. I'm sure that that conversation had to be had. It wasn't said in the scripture, but that's the way the process goes. So they knew that something had to come from this, so their whole intent was doing things their way. I'm not going to give anything. This is our vineyard now. This is, this is their choosing of what to do. But then verse 37 comes. Then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. Because the son going in place of the father is going in the authority of the father. See, first of all, even the servants were going in the authority of the owner. They were going representing the owner. They were going sharing what he had placed in their heart, what he told them to share, so that they could take that as the words of the owner. But now he says, since they're not listening to those who I'm sending, I'll send my son. They, they'll have to pay attention to him because they know that that's, my blood that's my son and they'll they'll respect him because they'll see him in the same likeness they would see me this was his thought anyway verse 38 it says but when the vine dressers saw the son they said amongst themselves this is the heir come let us kill him and seize his inheritance they said 
He's the one that's going to get everything that the owner of this vineyard owns. Let's kill him, and then we'll take this vineyard for ourselves. So they took him, and they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Verse 40. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? That was the question Jesus asked these religious leaders. What is he going to do? What would you do? You had every... Brother, he just went <laughs> off with his head. <laughs> you, had, you had full authority not just by law, but with, with the power and strength to do it because this was one of your, this was your vineyard you owned. This was your property. You could have gone in and just clean house. But he's asking what, he's asking them, what will the vineyard, what will the owner of the vineyard do? See, one thing that is seen so clearly is Jesus is making a point to try to take the blinders from their eyes. He's bringing them along. Remember they asked him, who gave you the authority? He's speaking of a fruitless vineyard because they're not dispersing this fruit. We just went through a fruitless fig tree, which was another picture of Israel that was not producing fruit. It just had green leaves. It looked like it was alive, but it was, it was truly fruitless. So it was cursed and will wither away. And that's what, that's what Jesus said. So now he asked them the question, what will he do? Verse 41, and they said to him, the religious leader said, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to, to another vine dresser who will render to him the fruits in their season. That's exactly what what common sense would tell you. That's where Jesus was leading them, exactly to that point. And verse 42, And Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Verse 43, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to the nations, bearing the fruits of it. He told them, this is you. See, even when, he, when Jesus is going through this, he's talking about how these, these servants were coming. Matthew chapter 23, verse 29. Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you built the tombs of the prophets and adorned the monuments of the righteous, and say, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would have been, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore you have witnessed against yourself that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Verse 33, serpents. Brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I, will, uh, I sent you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scour scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. Verse 35, that on, you, that on you may come all the righteous bloodshed on the earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel, to the blood of Zechariah. He's talking about the prophets from the beginning, first prophet to the last prophet. That they all came speaking to them. And it says, Whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Verse 36. Assuredly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Jesus was saying, I sent those prophets to you, those servants to tell you. And what did you do to them? They were, they were beaten, they were stoned, they were killed. And then God sent his son. And that's exactly what Jesus is pointing to. He's pointing to himself coming. He's pointing to himself coming. The son will come. And what will happen? 
It says, back in Matthew uh, 21, it says, in verse 39, So they took him, cast him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Where was Jesus taken and crucified? Outside the city. They cast him out and they crucified him. Every verse that we go through is a picture where Jesus is telling them, you, you are the ones that I'm talking about. You are the wicked vine dressers. God has given you this vineyard and this is what you're doing with it. He said, who placed, I, God placed them over the nation of Israel to, to cultivate the vineyard. God sent prophets whom they persecuted and they stoned and they killed. Let's go back to verse 43, chapter 21, verse 43. Then I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Jesus is speaking of the new covenant that was going to be made in his blood. Verse 44, And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Now then the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, and they perceived that he was speaking of them. Well, finally the light went on. <laughs> but when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for, for a prophet. So they were fearful. They understood what Jesus was saying. And Jesus was, was, was speaking of his death. See, everything has been provided. The Word of God says everything good comes from above. The picture of the vineyard. And even as we each have been given so much in our lives. We can be that, that wicked vine dresser or, or we can be used to glorify God in the things that we have. See, even throughout this whole week, it, it, it has been continually speaking of producing fruit. The word of God has been going through and it's been talking about being fruitful, being fruitful, being used. It was talking about this vineyard not being used to be fruitful. The fig tree not showing fruit. God desires for us to be fruitful. He wants us to bear fruit in our service to him. But sometimes we get like those wicked vine dressers where we say, you know what? It's my time. It's my life. These are my choices on what to do with. But when we come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we say, Lord, you are Lord of my life. Come into my heart. Change me. Make me different. Renew me. Give me a heart of flesh instead of this heart of stone. And our life is different then because what we've done is we've asked him to be our Lord and Savior, not just our Savior. Like when we talked about the, the triumphant entry, when everybody was rejoicing because the Savior was there, but they didn't want him to be Lord. They just wanted to be Savior. They didn't want the cross yet. The cross wasn't involved. It's easy to cheer when when all you're going to get is blessing and, and receive relief. But when it comes at a cost, that's when it's different. We've called Jesus Lord. If he's the Lord of our life, then we must be submissive to his will. And in being submissive to his will, we must know his word. Be, to be submissive to his will, we must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because of ourselves, this flesh won't do it. And even with the, with, the, with the help and the grace of the Holy Spirit, we still fall short of the glory of God. But we can't even consider thinking that we're going to be able to produce fruit without the Holy Spirit within us. Because truly that's where his guiding comes from in our life. We want to serve and be fruitful. Where are we to start? In the house of God. With those to your right, with those to your left. Being a part lifting up one another whether it's just in prayer whether it's in whatever we have need for one another how we can we can uh, share our hearts with one another but we're also to be used outside these walls because we're supposed to produce fruit and that fruit is going to draw others god wants to use us and and even tonight as as we read these things and god is calling us through this week we know that ne next uh, uh tomorrow night is going to be uh the last supper and the washing of the apostles feet 
And these are the, the last preparations before uh, the, the, the cross on Friday, before he's arrested. But in each step, we look at his life, and it is always his love for us. In everything that he has done, it is his love for us. Even in this, in this one parable, he's showing the love of the owner, the love of the owner of the vineyard, not wanting to go in to do these things. Even thinking that he would send his son. And Jesus is showing these religious leaders that the son came and he paid a debt. He came and died on a cross for you and I. He's the one that on, on this Friday that was coming was going to surrender his life for us. We've done nothing. We deserve nothing. And we have so much. Sometimes we might think we earned it. Well, I've worked hard for this. The only reason you have it is because God gave you the opportunity to work. Every good thing comes from above. We must not lose track of that. We must understand that what God's given us, he's given us to be tools in our hand to use to glorify him. That's the life of the believer. That's not just the life of someone that's in ministry or someone that's a, an elder in the church or anything. That's what each one of our lives is supposed to be. We're all, as Pastor Ray would always say, we're all in full-time ministry. That sounds like a dream too. <laughs> We're all in full-time ministry, and God wants to use us, but he wants us to, to, to bear that fruit. And, and this one scripture in closing I want to share is a, a well-known scripture that, that each one of us has heard many times in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. And the scripture is, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think, according to the power that works in us. That's the Holy Spirit. We cannot limit what God can do in our life. This is not speaking of prosperity, because there's many that stand behind pulpits that use this for, for prosperity, that God wants to bless your life. God wants to use us to bring Him glory. And He will do it in a manner that we can't even comprehend. It says, Ex exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ask or think. Our greatest thought, how could God use me in, in the strongest and the biggest way, how would God use me? And God says, I can give you more than that. All I need you to do is surrender to me, to be obedient to the call of the word of God and, and to continue to press on. Truly, God's people, we all have trials and tribulations we go through. We all have things the enemy has committed against us in so many different ways. But God is greater than those things. No matter what a doctor may say, no matter what situation might be going on, no matter what may be going on in the workplace, God is greater than these things. Even if it's getting out of bed, sometimes we look and we say, Lord, how, how can I be used that I'm having all these problems just getting out of bed? We can be on our knees. We can be used to pray. God will use us in many different ways, and he will strengthen us, and he will carry us through. So tonight I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to call the, the musicians. And Jesus continually showed himself to be God in the flesh. And even through this, pointing at the picture of the cross, even that the Son would come, the son would be cast out of the vineyard and killed. And Jesus came knowing this. Yet he loved you and I so much that he came and paid the price for our sin on that cross. Let's bow our heads and pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy in our life, Lord. Father, we look at our lives, Lord, and we just are overwhelmed by your goodness, Lord. We're deserving of nothing, absolutely nothing, Lord, and you give us everything. Father, so many, Father, suffer with so little, Lord, and you have blessed us with so much. Father, we thank you, Lord. And Father, we know that you have placed this in our hand, Lord, so that we would use it as a tool, Father, to shine for you. Father, bless your people tonight in a mighty way. Strengthen them where they feel weak and weary, Lord. 
Father, encourage their hearts, Lord. Strengthen their physical health as well, Lord. And do your mighty will in their lives, Lord. Father, in this week, Lord, we know that hearts may be open where they're not normally open. Father, even opportunities may arise before us that haven't been there, Lord. Father, give us even a heart to just reach out and to share your love with others, Lord. Father, to be fruitful, Lord. To reach out, Lord, in love, just like the love you gave to us. We weren't worthy of it, and you gave it to us. Help us to show it to others, Lord, and to point to you. We thank you for this time in your word, and we ask that you would even bless this time of prayer, Lord. If there's anyone here, Lord, that needs a touch from you, Lord, Father, you bring them to this altar. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. The altar is open if there's anyone that needs prayer, whether it's for your health, whether it's for a loved one that you're concerned for, that the Lord has placed on your heart, that that is far from God, you come forward. Come forward. The leaders are here. They'll pray with you. Praise God. Thank you. Amazing grace, so sweet the sound, save the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. was blind, but now I see. Yeah. 
is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. And all through, all throughout eternity, our song will be the same. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. from the grave Hallelujah Christ is risen and all through eternity and all throughout eternity our song will be the same Hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave Amen. We thank you, Lord, for your word and this challenging and encouraging word tonight. Not to take anything, your your favor for granted, Lord, not to be selfish and try to make it our own. But God, help us to live for you. You lived and died for us and you rose. Help us to, to live for you, God. We thank you, Jesus, for this time together. We can worship you and, and the rest of this week, tomorrow, prayer, Friday service and Sunday, the services. And we just commit ourselves to your hands tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, brethren.